Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 14th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the budget is out and we are at the fork in the road. Did the governor choose to make deep spending cuts, what we have referred to in previous programs as the path of the 16, or did he choose to continue business as usual? Second, what does the governor's proposal tell us about who will pay the additional revenues? Put another way, who is going to be taxed? And third, how should the legislature focus in the midst of a pandemic on all the things that will be on its plate this coming session? And now, let's join Michael. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, comes in every week to talk with us about the weekly top three, which are uh, what he thinks are three of the big issues that we need to be looking at in the state. And, of course, with the governor's budget dropping on Friday, uh, uh, there were some surprises, but there was also uh, kind of uh, some anticipation of what was going on. Brad has had a chance to kind of pick through it and talk about it, and we are going to start that discussion right now. Good morning, Brad, my friend. What's uh, what's happening, sir? Good morning, Michael. Uh, I've got to congratulate you on your ability to cause things to happen. Uh, last week, as we were going through the, the prep, you said, well, maybe the governor will drop the budget on Friday so we can discuss it on Tuesday as opposed to doing more prep. Right. And and there the governor did right on Friday. See, that's right on schedule. Just as I just as I planned it. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's uh, you know I think that's pretty I, historically. I think that's happened before, where you know it's the fifteenth is the first part of the previous next week, and they usually drop it on Friday. So, but uh, it's good to good to know that uh, I I can at least still predict things occasionally uh, accurately. Um, what uh, what's your first take on this, Brad? I mean, I. Was a little surprised at some of the discussion on the uh, on the uh, permanent fund payout and on the stimulus checks uh, and everything else. I think uh, Dunleavy understands that he still needs to try and deliver on some of those promises. I don't know how it's going to be, but let's start off with what in your take. What, you know, which path did he choose? Did he choose going the route of the sixteen, the sixteen stalwart Republicans, or is it more the business as usual path, or is it a hybrid? Let's uh, let's talk about that. Well, Michael, it's, uh, that's a good place to start because that sort of is, picks up from what we've been discussing the last couple of weeks. Uh, in large part, the governor went uh, went the business as usual route. Um, he uh, uh, did do some cuts uh, in uh, in in the current year or in the proposed fiscal year, uh, but uh, when you look at the ten year plan, uh, it's largely a, a business as usual plan. Now, I will, I will say this. When you look at the 10-year plan, uh, it is a significant ramp down from, from the, uh, the, 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 the trajectory we had been on in terms of year-on-year-on-year-on-year uh, on year on year on year increases. Uh, and it's even a ramp down, frankly, from uh, the, uh, the spend plus inflation uh, uh, discussion that he had uh, last year, the trajectory that he talked about putting uh, the state on uh, spending plus inflation. But in terms of significant cuts down toward uh, the, the level of traditional revenues uh, plus, uh, uh, plus the leftover from the, uh, the permanent fund draw after the uh, permanent fund dividend is paid, uh, it really doesn't accomplish much um, in that direction. When you look at the 10-year plan, uh, the, uh, there are cuts of about 
proposed cuts of about $300 million uh, in uh, FY22. Uh, as we've talked about previously on the show, the deficit's about $2.4 billion. Uh, so that $300 million, while uh, it's likely to be controversial and, and there's, there's likely to be pushback from at least some parts of the legislature, uh, it pales in comparison uh, to the to the size uh, to the size of the deficit. It's uh, it's not even a, a 10% cut. It's more in the neighbor neighborhood of a of a of a proposed uh, 5% cut in spending. And then you go out from there um, uh, again, looking at the 10-year plan. Um, it's 4.3 billion in FY22. It's 4.26 billion uh, in FY23. It's 4.1 billion. Um, in FY24, again, he's cutting out uh, the the growth, uh, uh, traditional growth in government for new programs and, and the like, um, and he's even cutting back on inflation. But he's not cutting into the into the meat of the budget in a way that's going to get him down toward uh, down toward traditional uh, traditional revenues. So, the the to put it in the in the um, uh, the framework that we've been discussing the last couple of weeks, uh, he chose the path of uh, t- when, when we talked about that there was a fork in the road between uh, uh, going down, continuing down the path we've been on, uh, or taking a new path and, and cutting deeply and relying on what I think is a fairly good core 16 in the legislature to back him up on deep vetoes. Uh, he uh, he chose the path of. Uh, of, uh, of going down uh, business as usual. I mean, he could have he could have more, been more strident on the business as usual path, though, right? I mean, he didn't have to uh, offer you know some of the stimulus and then rolling some of the spending into a bond instead of stretching that out over the years. I mean, there could have this could have been worse. I mean, you know, looking at it, am I wrong? Oh no, it could have been, it could have been it could have been worse. I mean, he could have he could have said we're going to hold it at spending plus inflation, which is. Uh, uh, Sort of was sort of the theme of last year's uh, uh, budget, and uh, and he's and he's the, at least the projections are uh, he's cut it from that. There, there's a there's a lot of of, um, of of delay. Let me use that word uh, in this budget. It's like it, it it's it's sort of the you know this year's special, this coming year's special. Uh, and we're not going to cut quite as much this coming year. He's going to he proposes to cut 300 million, but then it's a lot of that, uh, some of that gets added back in how he's treating the PFD. Uh, we're going to we're going to treat this coming year as special, and then we're really going to get serious in FY23. Well, uh, you know we've been down this road for 10 years. You can you sort of know where this road goes. Um, at next year, uh, let, let's say let's say we treat this year as special. Next year is an election year. Right. Not only it, not only is it an election year, it's one of the most complicated election years in Alaska's history. We've got a U.S. Senate race, which means a lot of outside money. We've got a governor's race. We're going to have a U.S. House race, uh, and then we've got redistricting, which means potentially all sixty legislators will be up again. Uh, we've got a constitutional convention. Uh, the the Senate Constitutional Convention question that's uh, that's going to be on the ballot that will get uh, that will get some attention. Um, it's going to be a, a it, plus we've got the the new uh, ballot measure uh, two uh, open primary uh, uh, slash uh, uh, rank choice voting uh, coming in. So the, the next year's election is just going to be or the the 22 election is just going to be one of the, hugely complicated. And so the legislature meeting next year. Uh, knowing that legislators knowing that they're, they're not going to make you know radical changes uh, next year, so it, it's 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 the it's sort of like the delay and kill or defer and kill thing that we've talked about uh, in in other contexts. Defer making the hard choices another year, and then it'll get killed because it's an election year, and then it'll be you know two years down the road before we get we get back to to really addressing this. So uh, yes, it could have been worse. Uh, the ten-year plan could have said we're just going to continue on with the 4.4 percent annual growth that we've had uh, the last uh, the last 20 years, or it could have been you know we're just we're going to do spending plus inflation. Could have been worse, but it's not the kind of cuts that uh, that will take us down to uh, traditional revenues uh, uh, plus the uh, the leftover uh, draw. It's not the kind of cuts that will avoid the need for uh, for new revenues, uh, and um, and that's I mean. 
Th that's the trajectory we're on. And once the governor says this, once the governor puts this plan out, it's going to be extremely hard, in fact, impossible, uh, for the governor to back up and say, well, now I'm going to change my mind and now we're going to do deep cuts. I mean, he sort of set the he sort of set the 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 bottom of uh, of where we're going to go in terms of in terms of cuts. And now the legislature will come back in and try to roll some of the some of the legislature will come back in and try to roll some of those back. Uh, and um, and so we're, we're really we're really not going to end up uh, any uh, anywhere approaching uh, the type of uh, deep spending cuts that uh, that some have advocated. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, Brad, so a couple things that came to mind as I read through the statements and the press releases and everything else. Uh, first and foremost, I know that you've been a, a, a strong opponent of uh, of drawing heavily from the earnings reserve. Uh, Governor Dunleavy took great pains to mention that this was, uh, you know, in his mind, a one-time thing. It's not something that you should expect the administration to go back to and do again and again. But that the pandemic and, and the economic situation and everything else kind of demanded it, that these were extraordinary times and these were extraordinary measures that he's taking. What, uh, what, what is your analysis of that specifically, that part of it? Uh, and, uh, you know, doesn't he have a point to say – if we've got this piggy bank now that we, you know, we don't want to obviously, you know, hurt our, I always like to say it's like our 401k, right? You don't always, you never really want to tap into the 401k, but if the house is burning down around you, sometimes you got to do it. You got to kill that long-term return to be able to survive, to reach the long-term in the long, in the, you know, in the, in the end result there. So what's your take on it? Well, I've sort of we've, we've sort of heard this story before. We heard this story through the through the last decade uh, about we'll get to spending cuts, we'll get we'll get everything restored. But this year's special, uh, we need to draw on the CBR. We're waiting on you know the, the the oil price cavalry to come over the hill, or the oil production cavalry to come over the hill, or the or the the spending cuts cavalry to come over the hill, and we just need to draw down these savings, the CBR and SBR, uh, just one more year, and and then we'll really get serious about it. Um, and uh, it never happened. I mean, we, we went through $20 billion. I did a calculation yesterday that I should have done a long time ago, uh, but, uh, but, but finally did it yesterday. That $20 billion we spent in the last decade uh, waiting for some cavalry to come over the hill, uh, that's $30,000 per Alaska man, woman, and child. That's not, that's not you know, just, just taxpayers. It's not just... Just uh, some subcategories, thirty thousand dollars per Alaska man, woman, and child. That's what that's what was spent over the last decade uh, putting off uh, putting off uh, uh, the the ultimately addressing this issue. And frankly, there's a lot to what the governor said uh, in this presentation uh, that that sounds a lot like that. I'm, I'm, may, maybe I've gotten a, a crass over the over the last decade hardened over the last decade, but I just, it was like, okay, here we go again. Let's, let's find another reason to put it off. The second thing I'll say is maybe that's a reason to do a supplemental uh, this, this spring, an early supplemental this spring. Uh, and I wouldn't argue that much uh, against an early supplemental uh, that, that drew a little bit uh, from the earnings reserve as long as it was treated as a loan to be paid back as opposed to just a taking uh, from uh, from future generations, uh, sort of like your 401k. You can borrow from your 401k, but you got to pay it back or else you pay a penalty. And I wouldn't I wouldn't get real excited uh, uh, adversely to to borrowing uh, a little bit for uh, for this spring. But uh, the bulk of what the governor is proposing in terms of putting this off uh, is in the next fiscal year, which doesn't begin until July 1. And if you listen to most economists, we're out of the, the vaccine has 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 fairly broad distribution by July one. Um, we're the, the economy should be on its way back up. If you look at uh, at at predictions of, of geo, uh, GDP and economic activity uh, by the second half of next year, which is when second half of the calendar year, which is the which is the beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, the economy's back up and running. It's strengthening. People have money. People are able to circulate again. We're able to get out there. So that's we're, 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 we would be putting the bulk of what the governor's talked about in a time frame when the economy is already coming back up. 
uh, and it is, and we'd be drawing down on 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 the 401k uh, at a time when when the economy is already already operating. So, I I, I listened to that, uh, perhaps with a somewhat skeptical ear because of the because of the the last decade and and hearing that over and over and over again as we blew through 20 billion dollars. Um, but 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 as I say, I would I would I would be open to something like that uh, uh, if it were done as an early supplemental. But I just don't think that it makes any sense to do it as part of the FY22 budget, uh, which doesn't begin until July one. I love it how Harold has selective memory. There isn't a single budget item being discussed, not a single cost driver, not a single idea to deliver services within the framework. We've gone over this. I mean, Brad and I have talked about this for six years. Why don't you just go back and listen to every Tuesday show for the last six years, and you'll find uh, discussions on every aspect of the budget, including discussions on opening up uh, spending uh, uh, formulas and uh, specific cuts and items to things like Medicaid and uh, different departments. We've talked about all this stuff. Now we're now we're broad picturing it because that's what we've got to do when we're looking at it from the ten thousand foot view at this point. But uh, well, well, and Michael, the governor's not talking about budget cuts. Yeah, we can talk about it all day long, but but the governor's got. If we're going to have deep budget cuts, the governor's got a lead on it, and and he did in 2019. He got burned uh, badly. There weren't 16 to back up the deep budget cuts he wanted to make. Uh, he got some budget cuts. He got support at, for from 16 for some budget cuts. Those ended up evaporating by the by the end of the session. Uh, and and in the subsequent last year and then in this year in the subsequent two years he hasn't touched that he hasn't touched that flame again so we can keep talking you and I can keep talking about it others can keep talking about it and go on and on and on about it but it's not it's not reality it's not what we're dealing in and and as we learn from the last decade every year we don't talk about reality is another year that we burn through uh, uh, savings and we burned through 20 billion last year. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's we we can talk about them ad, ad infinitum, but if the governor, this governor, doesn't step up and adopt them, and he hasn't, uh, uh, it's sort of it, we're just we're just you know wasting time talking about things that are that are unreal. Right. Um, let me go back. There was another comment there that I wanted to uh, say. Uh, Bill says, so if the Alaska legislature, who who don't follow the existing statute, present pretends it's a loan, because you were talking about you'd be okay with if we pulled it out, then you're okay with it. Is that how you're seeing it? Or uh, Because, again, I think the, the implication there is, of course, we could write it into statute all we want. We could say in, even in the intent language that it's a loan. But, I mean, they haven't paid back the constitutional budget reserve for the money that's owed to the CB. I mean, we owe $10 billion to the CBR. Uh, so I mean I can see that being qu- kind of a sticking point. What say you? Well, it's um, uh, y- you could probably uh, create some structure that would make it a formal loan that would have to be uh, have to be paid back. Um, uh, but even if you didn't do that, uh, sort of the moral authority of the legislature saying this is a loan, we're going to pay it back to future generations. That's something we're only really talking. In, in, in terms of the FY21 supplemental, we're talking about a billion dollars, um, and a uh, billion dollars you could amortize over over five years at 200 million dollars a year, uh, and it's really, I mean, it's fairly easy to uh, to accommodate. I, I, you know, in the rel- in the big scheme of things, it's relatively easy to accommodate. So I wouldn't. I mean, we do have we do have a a a, a, a a serious problem in this economy. We do have a lot of unemployment. We do have businesses uh, that are hurting a lot. We have a lot of unemployment. Uh, there are things that that would justify, I think, uh, 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 injecting a little bit more at the state level, particularly if the feds don't, uh, injecting a little bit more uh, at the state level. But it, but it needs to be done in FY21. By the time you get to FY22, it's way too late to really help uh, the state of the economy that's that's uh, that's in now. So I would I, I would not complain as much uh, about the draw. The governor wants to do that additional draw with as just you know just taking it out of the 401k uh, and uh, and saying uh, I I never have to pay it back. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think uh, I think if we were going to do it, uh, I think uh, uh, having the obligation to pay it back 
amortizing it over five years would be the right thing to do. Uh, William makes a point to say re, uh, uh, reserve monies, uh, saying that the earnings reserve monies are like a 401k is a bad analogy to me. He says the earnings reserve is there to be spent for the people in dividends, for the state government if needed. That's the beauty of the original traditional PFD statutes. Paying back the CBR is what's needed down the road. I mean, and that is part of the point is that the ERA was supposed to be used in that way, but also it does affect the earnings of the permanent fund in the long run. I'm just trying to analogize it so people understand it better. So we're going to move on to number two. Uh, Brad, give me a tease here before we go to break. Uh, who, well, ends, who ends up paying for all this when it's all said and done? Exactly. That's, that's I mean, the two questions that, I, that I've tried to focus our discussion on over the past several weeks has been which path is the governor going to go on? And if we go down the, the business as usual or the one that requires new revenues, as, as this path does, uh, who pays? Uh, who's going who's gonna to pay for that? Uh, and, the, and the 10-year plan doesn't answer that question, but it actually provides some fairly, some fairly good insights. So we're going to be discussing that in the second segment. Welcome back to the program. We're continuing now. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're on to the weekly top three. We're now on to number two. Uh, talking about the governor's plan, and the big question is, of course, who pays for it all? Brad's got some thoughts on that. Uh, Brad, uh, line us out on it. Well, so when you look at the 10-year plan, as I said, the governor uh, uh, has not, uh, has cut off, uh, has proposed to cut off in the 10-year plan uh, the the continued sort of unbridled growth the government's been on. He's even cut it back from uh, spending plus inflation, but there's still huge deficits as you as you go through the years. Uh, the ten-year plan in past years um, uh, dealt with that by by giving five scenarios and saying that you know there's the uh, there's one scenario where you just cut uh, cut that uh, uh, the the deficits uh, through cutting spending. The second is you you tax. Uh, uh, to raise the money for the additional deficits, another option is to is to reduce the PFD or cut the PFD to pay for uh, for those deficits. Uh, and then the fifth option in in, in past uh, ten year plans was what was called the balanced option, which was a combination of spending cuts, uh, PFD restructuring to go to to fifty POMV fifty fifty, uh, and then uh, uh, raising other revenues. This ten year plan is significantly different. From the last ten-year plans, and if people haven't looked at this ten-year plan, I, I would, I would recommend they do so. You can find it on the OMB uh, website. This ten-year plan is significantly different. Rather than going through the five scenarios that past ten-year plans have done, this ten-year plan has only one scenario, uh, and it's really the old balanced uh, uh, scenario. Uh, so if you look at FY23, beginning in FY23 and beyond. Uh, the plan incorporates three things. It incorporates uh, some spending cuts um, uh, to, to reduce it um, basically down to, to holding spending flat is basically where you end up over the 10-year period. PFD restructuring, uh, again, is, is not, is not talked about as a scenario anymore in the 10-year plan. It's talked about as part of the plan. Uh, so PFD restructuring down to POMB, uh, 50 50 so you've got cuts uh, from from cuts at least from growth uh, that otherwise would occur even spending plus inflation you've got PFD restructuring but that still leaves a a, a big a big hole and and the hole is defined in the 10-year plan uh, as other revenues uh, and there's a there's a sentence in the 10-year plan at the end of the 10-year plan before you get to the 10-year chart uh, that talks about taxes, and and so and so we're finally getting down to uh, a recognition that in order to deal with the state's fiscal situation, uh, we're going to have to have uh, some other revenues, uh, and those and 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 the T word uh, got used uh, in in discussion of that. Now it doesn't talk about who uh, gets taxed, uh, but at least the word taxes to me. And the way it's structured in the 10-year plan means this generation. Uh, it, 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 the governor was explicit in his discussion in the 10-year plan is implicit in this discussion that we don't continue rating the 401k, we don't continue rating the, uh, the permanent fund earnings reserve in order to 
uh, uh, balance the budget uh, uh, going forward. Uh, it, uh, it 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 talks about taxes, and I think that means uh, I think that clearly means this generation now. That opens up the door. Are we talking about flat taxes? Are we talking about a progressive income tax? Are we talking about sales taxes? Are we talking about you know something that looks like uh, PFD cuts, which is uh, which is regressive, hugely regressive, and hits middle and lower income Alaska families hardest? That debate uh, is 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 not solved by the ten year plan. But the but the fundamental question of who of of which generation is paying. Uh, at least uh, appears to be, and it appears to be resolved in favor of current Alaskans paying for current government costs as opposed to kicking it down the road. Now, there's one exception to that, and that's the next fiscal year. Uh, and and in that case, uh, in FY22, uh, by by deep draws on the ERA, uh, the governor is essentially saying who pays next year is future Alaska generations by reducing the investment base. Uh, that's in the permanent fund. So, a uh, big difference between how he treats FY22 uh, and, and and FY23 and beyond in terms of who pays next year. He's talking about uh, future generations kicking it down the road and and essentially taking money out of the investment base uh, that future generations are going to rely on. Uh, but but at least from FY23 forward. Uh, it's fairly clear that the plan now contemplates that the current Alaskans, the current Alaska generations, uh, pay for pay for their own costs. Well, and you could see it here in this line, which we're showing up in the Facebook chat room right now for people who want to go look. Uh, in the unrestricted general revenues, it says other revenue sources and start, and it's a significant amount. Starting in fiscal year 2023, it's 1.2 billion dollars of other revenue sources, meaning they're going to go after they would have to go out and find that. 1.2 and then down to 967 million and it hovers between 950 and a billion dollars for the next 10 years. So I mean it's a significant amount of revenue that would have to be raised to balance uh you know based on this plan. Yeah, I I tend to do these things in 10-year averages because that way you sort of watch out uh the uh, the the annual effect uh and and over that over the 10 years it's about a billion dollars yeah, it's a billion dollars, sixty million, but it's about a billion dollars in terms of uh, in terms of other revenue that's uh, that's going to be na- need to need to be raised. So uh, that's about a four percent flat tax. I mean, each percent of flat tax at current income levels, each each percent of uh, of a flat tax would raise about two hundred fifty million dollars. I don't mean to go down and start debating the flat tax, but but that's I mean that's the kind of level uh, that we're talking about. Uh, that's going to be, need to be raised by uh, by other revenues, and 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 that and and if you, you you can't really see it from that chart that you're on. I've plotted out on another chart that's on the Alaskans for sustainable budgets. I've layered on the amount of spending that otherwise would occur uh, if we stayed on the on the traditional uh, uh, trajectory we've been on, and you can see that that le- those level of spending cut spending. Restraint is probably a better way to put it. That that level of spending restraint averages out over the ten years to about 1.3 billion dollars. So it's 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 in part uh, a spending restraint. It's in part PFD restructuring, uh, which raises about 500 million dollars average over the the ten year period. And then it's in part uh, these other revenues that will come from uh, come from the current generation. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. So down at the bottom of the uh, weekly top three, number three, how the heck does the legislature work through all this, especially with the pandemic? And you see some uh, insight into this uh, with comments from Bryce Edgman. Yeah, there's a there's a, a, a uh, an article on the budget in the Juno Empire, which if people haven't read, I would I would recommend the the headline is Dunleavy proposes budget for unprecedented times. And if you go down through the down through the article, there's some comments from Bryce uh, that uh, that talk about how the heck are we supposed to do this? Uh, we're in a pandemic. We're going to be in a pandemic this com- this coming session. There's going to be socially social distancing. There's going to be restrictions on on how the legislature operates. Um, uh, there's going to be uh, 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 some stiltification, if you will, in the process as a result of the restrictions from the pandemic. Uh, how how is the legislature supposed to deal with all these issues, uh, the proposed uh, supplemental for FY21, uh, the proposed taking from the ERA uh, for FY22, 
uh, as well as start planning on what these other revenues are going to be like, start structuring what these other revenues are going to be like, <coughs> excuse me, in FY23 uh, and beyond. In in a in a legislative session that's, that's otherwise constrained, and and he makes good points about that's going to be a very difficult thing to do. I've made one recommendation that I'll continue hitting on. I think that whoever organizes this legislature from the very first day, House Finance and Senate Finance, the two finance committees, need to have a special subcommittee that's focused entirely on looking at. Uh, FY23 and beyond, because you know one of the complaints about other revenues is, well, we wouldn't really get them if we, we wouldn't really uh, have them in time for this coming fiscal year, um, and so uh, uh, and so I think they need to start focusing on it now. Brad Keith, Lee Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Your quick comment here on Bert Stedman's uh, seeming, uh, you know, at least lukewarm. He wasn't cold shouldering the governor. At least he was looking at it. What do you say to that quickly? Well. Stebbins talking about FY21, talking about unemployment, and saying, yes, maybe we need to do something in FY21. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, I think, I think that has some logic. But if we do it by pulling out of the ERA, it needs to be in the form of a loan. It doesn't need to be in the form of, of, a, of, a, of a, we're just going to take your money and, and, and use it ourselves instead of ever you know, giving it back to you. Give me your final thoughts here as we uh, get ready to wrap into next week. Um, I mean, where do you see this going? Uh, where do you see things, uh, you know, happening here? Um, the, 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 the CBR, excuse me, the ERA and the CBR and the reverse sweep, none of those things are really being discussed. But does Governor Dunleavy have enough hold to be able to put a roadblock into some of those things where we're seeing some of the games being played, uh, you know, accounting wise with monies coming in and out and the, and the sweep? He's not. Uh, he's, he's not indicated that he intends to do that, Michael. I mean, it's the time to talk about the reverse sweep. The time to talk about bringing those revenues back in uh, was was this in the in the in the budget proposal, and basically what he said. What he said. In fact, I think there's a. I think he specifically addressed uh, the reverse sweep. Uh, I seem to recall that from one of the quotes. But but if not, the the general tenor of his discussion is we're not going to rock the boat uh, this session. Now he put that off to the pandemic and. You know, basically, Alaskans are hurting. I don't want to cut spending anymore. I don't want to disrupt things anymore. Uh, uh, we just need to, to take money for, out of the ERA, excess draws out of the ERA. But uh, but the time for him to do that was uh, was the time for him to show leadership on that uh, was in the budget. And and he's just you know he's he's basically taken a pass on it. And and there are going to be I mean there's going to be segments of the legislature that are going to try to do that, but without the governor whipping the vote. Without the governor showing leadership on it, uh, I just I just don't see that happening. So I think I think he's I think he's given up on those things, whether it was whether it was the recall uh, or it, it, it's the pandemic or or what is the motivator. I, I just think he frankly he's given up on those things and and uh, and and has decided that we're just going to keep on going down this road. He's going to try to restrain spending from growing. Uh, which is a good thing, but it still leaves a big hole that that has to be filled, uh, and I and I think that's uh, that's where that's where we go next. Okay, I, I will I will I will add one other thing. You ask you ask what I think is going to happen in this legislature. <coughs> I'll tell you what I fear, um, uh, which is which is sort of the same thing as as what I uh, would think in the in the deepest darkest part of the night. Uh, what I fear. Is they do raid the ERA, uh, and once they raid the ERA, uh, uh, once they do an excess draw out of the ERA, that's where we're going to go. Uh, a lot of talk about oh, we're going to get it right. This is this is the 2010s all over again. Uh, once they raid the ERA, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about oh, we're going to get it right next year. But next year, as I said, is an election year, one of the most complex election years. Alaska will ever face the legislature is not going to show any, and the governor is going to be up for a re-election. He's not going to show any great leadership uh, in that session. And then we go on to FY24, and, and it just gets too easy. So my fear is that that those who want to raise the ERA prevail. There's a lot of talk about oh, we don't want to do this, but we've got to do it this year. Um, and then next year there'll be sort of similar talk, and we'll just keep going down that road until the ERA. Uh, is drained, taxing future Alaska generations as we go. 
and this generation will have ended up leaving future generations worse off than than this generation uh, received received it from past generations and i think that's just reprehensible but but my fear is uh, that that's where it's going, and 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 I'm concerned, hugely concerned, that the that the governor is going to be leading the way do, to do that, uh, because he's the one that's opened Pandora's box in terms of talking about rating the ERA. All right, Brad Keithley, uh, always a ball of sunshine on these Tuesdays. Thank you for coming on board <laughs> and uh, and being part of it. Uh, we're just calling them like we see them, folks. That's all we can do. So, Michael, thanks for having me on. Appreciate, my friend. Thank you for being on. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.